Well, welcome to our next session in Luther's To the Christian Nobility of the German Nation, 1520. We'll begin, um, we broke our last session into two parts, so we'll begin with the second part of that, um, and we'll start with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Eternal and gracious God, we are grateful to you for another day in your wonderful world. Allow us this day to draw closer to you. As we go through this time of study, open our hearts and minds more and more to who you are, to better understand the struggles of your people, and to engage in our own faith in you, to live boldly as your children. Help us, O Lord. We offer this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll start with question 15. Question 15. The question is, describe the situation as Luther saw it in paragraph 2 on page 424, and I will read that for you. Luther writes, We also see how the priesthood has fallen, and how many a poor priest is overburdened with wife and child, his conscience troubled. Yet no one does anything to help him, though he could easily be helped. Though the Pope and bishops may let things go on as they are and allow what is heading for ruin to go to ruin, yet I will redeem my conscience and open my mouth freely, whether it vexes Pope, Bishop, or anybody else. And this is what I say. According to the institution of Christ and the apostles, every city should have a priest or bishop as St. Paul clearly says in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. And this priest should not be compelled to live without a wedded wife, but should be permitted to have one, as St. Paul writes in 1 Timothy and in Titus, saying, A bishop shall be a man who is blameless and the husband of but one wife, whose children are obedient and well-behaved, etc., According to St. Paul and also to St. Jerome, a bishop and a priest are one and the same thing. But of bishops, as they now are in the scriptures, known, know nothing. They have rather been established by an ordinance of the Christian community so that one priest will have authority over many others. So... Describe the situation that Luther is presenting here. What is he saying about the state of the church? That the priests are overburdened and that they should be allowed to marry, uh, <coughs> to be wedded to one wife and have obedient children. Good luck on the last one. Yes. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. How yeah. many cool. preachers, kids? PKs, as they're known. Yes. PKs. <laughs> the PKs seem to go to one extreme or the other. Either they totally buy in or they totally uh, buy yeah. out. Yep. I was a PK, so I'm very familiar with that. Uh-huh. <laughs> Corinne's a PK, and, and she went. She came the church way. Thank yeah, goodness. we know others. <laughs> Um, yeah, Luther's comments here are reflecting what is it, what is it the church really look like, and what he's seeing is that um, priest, parish priest, you know, what is the role of a priest? A priest, a pastor, is set apart by the community, the faith community, to a position to lead the community, to preside over the sacraments, to teach the word, to a life dedicated to serving in that capacity. In the early church, pastors and priests were married. In the early church, that we have hit, we have records that indicate there were women who served as priests. What are you talking about when you say early church? Uh, the first centuries of the church. Okay. Yeah, in the first centuries of the church, these things were going on. In the Catholic Church. In the church, yes. In the church. Yeah. Uh, so celibacy doesn't come around and, and is not made law in the church until the 12th, 11th, 12th century. Yeah, it's a long time after So it's, it's it centuries later they're making these modifications. And what Luther is seeing is that the, the, the guy in the local village church is not getting what he needs. 
that that person is not being supported. He's overburdened and he needs support. But where does all the support go? Financially, it's all going off to the bishop who then sends it off to Rome. And that hierarchy is not serving the church, but rather is a system of taking and wealth making for some people. Remember, Luther also will go out and visit parishes and hear what's going on, and he's disgusted because some of the priests can't even correctly pronounce or say the Mass, that they're not able even to do the Latin correctly at that time, and that sermons, well, good luck. Um, he, the church... In, you know, at hierarchical levels looked real pretty and had all kinds of nice things. At the parish level, struggling. And so it's the spiritual well-being of the local church that Luther sees is abominable. And it's because of the system. Let's go to question 16. Question 16. What would Luther's recommendation look like uh, page uh, paragraph 3, page 424, on to page 425. And Luther writes, so, so that we clearly learn from the apostle that it should be the practice of Christendom for every town to choose from among the community a learned and pious citizen and trust him the office of the ministry and support him at the expense of the community. He should be free to marry or not. He should have several priests or deacons also free to marry or not as they choose to help him minister to the masses and the community with word and sacrament as is still the practice in the Greek church. So what would it look like? Certainly there would be somebody in the leadership role who is qualified or the most qualified. Yep. So how that plays out today in the Lutheran tradition is this congregation calls a pastor. This congregation compensates a pastor. And the pastor works, his, the pastor's responsibility is word and sacrament for this community of faith and for the greater community. That's, we're now living into what Luther laid out. That's what my role is. I am not set apart because, because I wanted it. I am set apart because I am called, both by God and by the body, the church body. And then this community of faith discerned to call me specifically. So that's how, I mean, we're living into what he's saying. Luther also, this is one of the places we see that, that Luther is aware of orthodoxy. Um, the ortho, the Eastern Church, and he says, what is going on, the system he's laying out, is what the Greeks are still doing. The Eastern Church is still doing that. And, you know, for example, in the uh, Orthodox tradition, if you marry before you are ordained, you're allowed to be a married priest. After you're ordained, um, if you divorce or your spouse dies, you are supposed then to remain celibate. Um, so that, I mean, that is the practice today. If you are not married by the time you are ordained, you're not supposed to get married then. Um, but that's is, their tradition. This is a very simple question. Mm -hmm. uh, a simple-minded question. Is the reason the Catholic Church uh, maintains celibacy because Christ was not married? No. Why did they? Why did they? Or you know, they are married to the church, the same with the nuns. They're married. But to it the was church. also financial. Money. Notice Money. what he talked about in oh, that yeah, first yeah. part. He said they did not take care of the priest. The money funneled to Rome. They had tons of money there. No money at the local level. So it had all to do with finance. It had nothing to do with scripture. It was all based on finance. Well, especially since they say that Peter was the first pope. Peter was married. Yep. yep. <clears throat> Unless we want to ignore that he had a mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> but golly, that was a Jesus story. You know, do we throw that one out for convenience? 
We yeah. throw a lot of things out well, for this... convenience if we're trying to push something that ain't scriptural. Yeah, and there's also comment about both in the um, bishoprics and in the papacy as well as priesthood about the number of wives and children being supported by the finances of the church. Because certainly in Rome, we know in that time frame, there were all kinds of bad things happening. Um, the Borgias, when they were holding the papacy, um, were not celibate. Uh, they were, you know, they, they, and they didn't hide that, you know, that, that this stuff was going on. Celibacy has nothing to do with theology. Nope. Now they've tried, the Roman church has tried to come up with justification for it, and they've created a, spirit, a theology around it, but it's not scriptural. That's what Bug Luther. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Luther See, they made they they made the mistake of sending that man to school to study. <laughs> the more he studied, he kept looking at himself and going, "Really, this stuff doesn't match up." Yep, I got a problem with this. That yep. was their mistake. Yep, his education was was you know supported by the Catholic Church. Oops. They ruined you know, the day. <laughs> that's, that's funny because I always think back to a statement my grandmother made. In Norway, the, the pastors are paid by the state. Mm -hmm. And when she came to America, she questioned, why do we have an offering? You know, they're paid by the government. Oh, she thought. Please write that down for me. Seriously, write down as much as you can remember about that. Because one of the challenges in American Christianity has been stewardship. Why? Because in Europe, it's the state church. And all those immigrants that came over here, this was totally foreign. It that was. we have an offering. Yeah. What are we supposed to do with that? Why? Yeah. And who built the churches in, in Europe? It no, wasn't no. your grandparents' family. It, it was none of our... It was the wealthy landowners who funded buildings yeah. so even at that level the the basic parishioners it that's a totally I, I would love for you to write that down because uh, we're losing that memory and it's significant because that's part of the struggle we still have is that, that understanding offering I was a child when I overheard the conversation and uh, that really stuck with me for some reason Cool. Well, let's go to number 17. Number 17. Discuss the history of clerical celibacy. Here we go. Um, paragraph 2, page 425, and the side note 90. Um, but the Roman see has interfered and out of its own wanton wickedness turned this into a universal commandment that forbade priests to marry. And in the side note, the earliest papal prescription of clerical marriage dates back to um, the fourth century. But a serious effort at enforcing clerical celibacy in the Western church began only in the 11th century. It reached its apex in the 12th century when the first and second Lateran councils, 1123 and 1139, made clerical marriage not only unlawful but invalid which meant that all sexual relations between a priest and a woman, whether they were married or not, was classed as fornication and their children illegitimate. So there we have exactly what we were getting at, that not until the 11th and 12th century. So why would the church suddenly make that change 11, 12 centuries after the Gospels, and knowing that Peter was married. I think they hearken back to where Paul, in one of his letters, I want to say Corinthians, but I'm probably wrong, um, wrote that if you're not married, maybe it's better if you don't. Yes. It, but if you need to marry, it's better to marry than to burn. And um, one might assume he means burn with passion, but a Catholic told me that that actually means burn in hell for getting married. Um, the other side of it is that as 
the Vatican is accruing all the money, they don't want to have to spend money to help support wives and children. Yep. And that gets at it. It becomes a financial, and it, there's no justification for it. If a person feels led and wants to marry, they should marry. If a person doesn't feel led and want to marry, they shouldn't marry. But it should not be controlled by law through the church in that way. Just, and today, um, I, I with with Catholic Catholic priest friends, I still don't under fully understand um, that they've been, they they choose to go into that. Um, willingly, yeah. but the church encourages it still. The Roman church still does. Let's look at question 18. Question 18. Luther sees an underbelly to celibacy of the priest. Explain paragraph 3, 425. Here's what he says. My advice is to restore freedom to everybody and leave every man the free choice to marry or not to marry. But then there would have to be a very different kind of government and regulation of church property. The whole canon law would have to be demolished and a few benefices could be allowed to get into Roman hands and, and few benefices. I fear that greed is the cause of this wretched, unchaste celibacy. Explain. I think that's what we've been talking about, is the underbelly. It really has nothing to do with being faithful to Christ, but everything to do with the governmental system of the church and the control. And uh, because if you have children, if you have a wife and a children, they need support. That means twice the, twice, if you're just married, twice the amount of food, twice the amount of shelter and clothing, twice the amount of um, health needs. If you have children, well, they need education, clothing, food. Um, they're going to be a distraction, but that's natural to human life. But if you don't let the priest marry, then you are only taking care of one. And you don't have to do that overly because they're, you know, austerity was also encouraged. So more and more money can go off up the chain. Hmm. Worse yet, if a priest married and had kids, there might be heirs. Yes. Yep. So yep. That's something else that the Vatican can't get. And I think I'm not 100% sure of this. You know, okay, so who owns our church property? Who owns our property? The church. The congregation. The congregation. Mm -hmm. Now, if we would close, if we would shut down and First Lutheran no longer exist, there are two options. One is that the congregation can sell the property and decide where that money goes. And we have law, we have rules on where the money can go. It cannot go to individuals. It can, we couldn't all say, hey, well, let's sell this and we each get a nice chunk of change. No, it would have to go to a ministry um, it could go to a nonprofit, but that the church could choose to close, sell the building, and disperse the monies. If the church congregation does not do this, do that, then the EL, the synod of the ELCA, will take ownership of the property. We did this in um, Freeport. Uh, the congregation closed. They literally just. I mean, it was down to a handful of people. They literally just walked out of the building, locked the door, ne'er to go back in. And they did nothing. And two years later, the Synod office got a call from the city of Freeport that the yard needed mowed badly. <laughs> First clue that it wasn't being taken care of. Huh. So wow. we, and the, the Synod, the bishop's office went through the process with the Synod council to legally take ownership, then we sold the property. The funds then went into the synod. Those funds were deemed out to a mission. I mean, it's not like they're sitting there getting, oh, we can spend money, but they go directly back to further mission. So that's how we deal with it. But I believe in the Roman system, the owner of the properties in the diocese 
is the bishop or cardinal. And then after that, the, and if that, you know, but the ultimate ownership is still the Roman see, the Vatican. Um, if you go to the Josephinum in, um, on Route 23, just above the Outer Belt in Columbus, Ohio, it is a phenomenally beautiful seminary owned by the Vatican. So they, the, there's still some parts of this when it gets to property that the, the tendons of the church are still out there holding onto the wealth. And um, they also are in a crisis. They're selling buildings like crazy um, because they've closed so many churches, specifically in the north, um, because people have moved. Uh, you go to Chicago, Detroit, um, Milwaukee, um, Toledo, uh, Cleveland, um, Buffalo, Syracuse, Albany, New York City, and all up through New England. You've got massive buildings that are empty. Yeah. And they're selling them off because the congregations no longer exist. That's so sad. Yeah. So the, sad. And some of them are huge. Um, wow. Massive buildings. Question 19. Question 19. What does Luther say in the top paragraph on 426? So it begins at the bottom of 425, and I'll read that. I here take no account of popes, bishops, cathedral, canons, and monks, whose offices were not instituted by God. They have taken these burdens upon themselves, so they themselves will have to bear them. I want to speak only of the ministry that God has instituted, which consists of presiding over a community with word and sacrament, living among them, and maintaining a household. What does Luther say? Just get back to the biblical ministry that God had ordained. Yeah. Get back to how God intended it to be set up. And if you go back to the Old Testament and see some of the ways that Israel had been organized, the dividing of power, to, to it became very localized, and it was not a money-making system. It was a, a tending to the people system. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's describing here. You know, do, do we in our synod or any place in the ELCA have a cathedral? No, we do not have a cathedral. <clears throat> we own buildings, but we do not have a cathedral. We've minimized the amount of money going into a bishop or a presiding bishop's office. We've minimized that because those are uh, um, nothing more than administrative offices to help parishes in doing ministry together and doing min more ministry. It is not that that is where the wealth and the power are. You know, it just makes so much more sense what Luther was trying to do because a pastor or a priest back then, you know, if he was married, had children, lived among the people, he would understand the problems and could counsel mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. He had a better understanding than a celibate priest yep. who is separated from the daily routines of marriage and raising children. And I think that it, it goes hand in hand with the further development of canon law that it, rather than understanding, living amongst, and ministering to, it became more easy to have rules. And, you know, the simple rules that, that um, they then could require people to live under, rather than living with in, in a dynamic relationship of faith in the community, it became more about a rigidity. This is what you must do. Oh, you want a divorce? No, you cannot. Unless you pay. Unless you pay. <laughs> right. So that, yeah. 